let me extend on behalf of the three organizations, the ICSB, C3S, and the Press Institute of India, let me warmly welcome uh, this morning Professor Via Natri, Dr. P.K. Ghosh, and Professor Shankari Sundararaman. It's very good to have the three of you here. We look forward to the next session and the session after that, uh, which will uh, be chaired by Komodo Vasan. I see that there are some new names uh, uh, or, or, or people who went with us on day one who are here for their benefit. Although Komodo Vasan is known to many of us, a brief introduction. Komodo Vasan, who retired after serving the Indian Navy, is head of strategy and security studies for Asia studies, and he's also the director of the Chennai Center for China Studies and regional director of the National Maritime uh, Foundation, Tamil Nadu, an alumnus of the Defense Services Staff College and the College of Naval Warfare. Komodo Vasan has had a distinguished career spanning more than 34 years. His wide ranging appointments, both at sea and shore, include command of warships, appointment in the carrier bond wing of INS Vikrant. A command of long range maritime reconnaissance and anti submarine warfare squadron, which is a major naval air station, INS Rajali, and commanded another air station, INS Garuda, on the west coast. He was on the faculty for over two years at the Naval War College that trained senior level officers from all the three services. Commodore Vasan was on deputation to the Indian Coast Guard from 2000 to 2003 as the Eastern Regional Commander with maritime jurisdiction in the Bay of Bengal, including the Indo-Bangladesh maritime border and the Indo-Sri Lanka maritime border. Needless to say, but I must point this out, that Commodore Vasan and his team at C3S have been a great source of support for both ICSB and PII in organizing such webinars and, of course, the workshops we've had earlier. Over to you, Commodore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sashi, for that introduction. And I'm very happy to see so many people who I know from the past. I'd like to lead on from the previous session, which was a very important one, in trying to understand the potential of uh, comprehensive maritime power. Uh, I must uh, thank Admiral Murli Dharan, who quoted from uh, uh, Sadar Panika, because though it was written decades ago, every word that's been written there, every sentence that is there, tells us how we have perhaps failed Sadar Panika in understanding the importance of the oceans. So that, that's a sad part. Also, you know, from the previous sessions, since there are a lot of extras here, I just would like to make only one point to say that it is not all that pessimistic as was presented, but we are good at acknowledging facts, which is a very great strength of a democracy. You know, what China can do obviously cannot be done by us. You know, we are trying to differentiate between a PSU and a private yard. And there are no such differentiation in China. So everybody is told to get on with business and provide targets by in five years or 10 years or whatever, which is why where they are. It does not mean that we replicate everything there. There are good practices. And we'll definitely copy some of the good practices that are there. You know, I, I'm just taking another two minutes to, uh, you know, reassure the audience here, which also consists of a lot of youngsters who should not feel that all is lost for a maritime India. It is not so. Let me reassure you. In fact, in the last four to five years, you know, the inland waterways, that was mentioned by Admiral Murli Dharan has been given a lot of importance. We started moving ships and cargo in this. We have connectivity to Calcutta and uh, ports in Bangladesh. You know, there is a phenomenal amount of importance given to, uh, you know, increasing our heft in the maritime domain. So this is only uh, to reassure all of us that, uh, yes, it is all work in progress. But, you know, unless there is this maritime consciousness that we are talking about, there's not much that we can do. They, the policy formulations have been uh, taking some time, and but that's perhaps okay in a democracy with the governments coming and going. But as long as there is a maritime culture, which is what we are trying to bring about through these forums, and everybody understands the importance of uh, geography, importance of uh, uh, you know what we need to do, uh, then I think would have done a lot of justice. As uh, Mr. Sashi has brought out, we are roughly behind by about 30 minutes. Uh, and that, that's not a good sign, uh, which only means perhaps we may have to skip lunch session like yesterday. That means we'll continue without the lunch. But I would not like to deprive uh, the wonderful three speakers that we have today uh, of their presentation. However, I'll request them to uh, restrict it to 15 to 20 minutes. And I will definitely sound the warning bell around 15 minutes so that you have enough time 
to conclude the session. Another request that I have is that I see many of them who have got their cameras on. Uh, the cameras could only be kindly switched on only by those who are in the panel. And all the others are requested to kindly mute themselves as well as switch off their cameras so that there is no distraction. And also we are conserving our bandwidth. Let me welcome uh, Professor Atri, uh, Professor uh, you know, Shankari, who I have known for uh, decades now, and also uh, the others who are here. Uh, let me also introduce each one of them. Just give me a second. Yeah, we have uh, uh, Professor Atri who will go first, and uh, he is uh, uh, the chair in the Indian Ocean Studies CIOS at the Indian Ocean Region Association, which was formerly the IORARC, and it was uh, brought down to IORA uh, to give it more uh, meaning and uh, brevity. And he's been there since 2014. He's one of the leading experts on blue economy. You know, uh, when we are talking about building a comprehensive national power, which is the theme of this session, we need to understand that everything that we want to do to build a comprehensive maritime power potential is defined virtually by the blue economy. You know, whether it is tourism, whether it is shipbuilding, whether it is uh, infrastructure, whether it is port led development, whether it is uh, uh, even, uh, uh, you know, the harnessing of the oceans for living and uh, non living resources. It's important that we understand that blue economy will drive our uh, resource management and also uh, enable us in this journey to become a comprehensive maritime uh, power enabled nation. Uh, he's also been the architect of the blue economy in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, and he is the managing editor, a journal of Indian Ocean Dream Studies, which is available online. And he's also been a visiting scholar at the University of California, Los Angeles, and at George Washington University. Uh, so he's contributed intentionally to the six priority areas and to the two focus areas of IORA, which also synchronize with the sustainable development goals. Uh, with this, may I request Professor Atri uh, to lead the discussions and you have 20 minutes, sir. And with your permission, I'll remind you at 15 minutes so that we do not overshoot the time allotted. And also have enough time for question and answers. Thank you. And over to you, Professor Atri. OK, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Vasan, uh, for this uh, uh, introduction. In fact, it is a great honor uh, to be with you and I have been listening most of the uh, presentations since uh, yesterday. And uh, I'll be trying to uh, build up uh, my lecture in three phases. One is basically, uh, I must admit that uh, I am an economic philosopher, philosophizing the paradigm shift, you see. So that basically, let me take all of you back to uh, the structure of scientific revolution, a book which was published by Kuhan, a philosopher in 1969, where he talks about uh, the nature of scientific revolution and why there is a paradigm shift. The paradigm shift occurs because of the fact that the contemporary theories which are in circulation are unable to solve the existing or contemporary problems. So in that context, if uh, I go back, the paradigm shift has started long back sometime in the 1960s. I have been studying this blue economy since uh, 2014, before I joined as a chair in Indian Ocean Studies, I was uh, called by the MEA, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, New Delhi, and uh, the Joint Secretary there asked me a question, Professor Atri, Ayura is focusing on blue economy since October 2014. Will you be able to manage it? And at that time, or even today, I share with you, if you talk to at least 10 economists, seven or six of them will say, no, no, we don't know what is blue economy. So in that context, basically, 
in soon after my joining on 4th and 5th may 2015 there was a conference organized by iora in durban south africa and where there was one session on blue economy and as a researcher i was asked to speak what are the research and uh, research possibilities of the academician in blue economy and i remember at that time i raised the question the very first question of defining blue economy the measurement of blue economy the definition of blue economy the assessment of the exclusive economic zones these were the three questions which uh, i discussed in my presentation and i remember that most of the delegates from all the 21 countries because at that time iora was uh, uh, 21 countries now it is a organization of 22 countries and there are now 10 dialogues uh, dialogue partners it's a very uh, growing and dynamic organization well committed to blue economy so then some of the some of the people they said that uh, prof why you are talking about uh, definition we are not concerned about definition it is a action oriented program it is a policy oriented program and let's let us concentrate on that but i i continue to disagree with all these suggestions and then i i saw that in 2015 16 the world bank the other international organization wwf then the commonwealth then the other regional uh, groupings they have they started talking about the blue economy so and uh, they try to uh, give the definition of the blue economy although there is no consensus on the definition of the blue economy and there cannot be consensus on the definition of the blue economy but for if i try to define in terms of cohen paradigm shift the hard core of the blue economy is becoming very much vivid and clear there is no controversy in that and what is that hard core that hard core can be defined in terms of what we say sustainability sustainable use of oceanic resources that is the sdg goal 14 life below the earth below water so that basically over the last you see i may say 10 years because i can take back to the year 2010 when guntar pali published a book uh, blue economy 100 million jobs 100 innovations and in 10 years so that brought a revolution in the blue economy and in that basically he started uh, with the 21 principles of blue economy which are scientific in nature so in that way from time to time I also try to give the various definitions of the blue economy, but now a broad idea, the broad consensus about the definition of the blue economy is converging towards the increasing level of economic activity in the ocean development space without compromising with the health of the ocean. So healthy ocean, productive ocean can lead us to the prosperity. I will not go into the details of that oceans are vital because oceans are vital. They produce more than 50% of the oxygen needed for the people and they are already stressed. Oceans are already stressed and marine plastic pollution, ocean acidification, mitigation of climate change and all that. These are some of the very important problems with which oceans are struggling. And then basically what is being done by the WWF, what is being by, done by the World Bank and other international organization, and what is the role of the ocean economy or the blue economy in terms of uh, uh, revitalizing the economy. So these are some of the things which uh, I will try to uh, touch very hurriedly. But first of thing, let me start with the definition of ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? It is also called environment. Is a natural unit consisting of all plants, animals, and microorganisms, biotic factors in an area functioning together with all known living physical uh, abiotic factors of the environment. So that is basically we should first try to understand the definition of ecosystem and the 
in the different part of the world the ocean have different ecosystems divergent ecosystem in terms of loss, uh, biodiversity and all that and if i come to the indian ocean indian ocean is very rich in terms of the biodiversity and then if i come to india india basically ha uh, has a very rich biodiversity in that way then basically it is a question of uh, uh, talking about environmentalism environment so in in uh, you see 90s there was a wave of environmentalism green green accounting then basically it is green uh, green investment and all that and then if i take back to to 2012 united nations sustainable development conference and there the seeds small island developing countries made a case for ocean economy that uh, you are talking about the green economy why don't you talk about the ocean economy because ocean economy is very crucial and if you go to the uh, data of the exclusive economic zone to some of the very tiny uh, island states they have extensive exclusive economic zone for example in mauritius we have 2.3 million square kilometer of exclusive zone whereas the area of mauritius and land landmass of the in mauritius is 2064 kilometers so in that way there are vast resources in the exclusive economic zone available to the small island countries so in that case basically the question emerges how or in what way we can utilize these small island developing countries resources or the oceanic resources then there is a question of you see uh, there is there is a concept of blue economy there is a concept of brown economy there is a concept of uh, uh, ocean economy and most of the countries there are 20 leading countries uh, uh, in in area of uh, ocean economy which have been talking about in terms of measurement assessment and also basically the industry classification if you try to say uh, us china and uh, other european countries so uh, basically in china they started this blue economy uh, long back during the 11th five year plan that goes back to 2006 to 2010 and then then basically at present the share of uh, marine economy they call or the blue economy or the ocean economy in chinese gdp is uh, uh, greater than 10% and it provides uh, uh, employment to uh, more than uh, 30 million people so that basically is the data part which i will be covering uh, later on but uh, now being a chair in indo ocean studies i must try to tell you what we have been doing in iora since 2014 so basically the first conference on ocean economy prior to the adoption of blue economy as a uh, as a cross cutting issue uh, when australia was the chair that was organized in bangladesh in september 2014 after one month in october there was the com meeting in perth australia when australia was the chair so in 2013 women economic empowerment was adopted as a cross cutting issue and in october 2014 iora adopted blue economy as a new paradigm shift economic paradigm model for for ushering an era of prosperity for the benefit of the people in the indian ocean region and all the member countries agreed to that so then basically the india India was the chair of Iora in 2011. The India's contribution is significant in identifying six priority areas of uh, Iora. That is in terms of uh, maritime safety and security, fishery, uh, the, then the, uh, this uh, trade and investment facilitation, uh, fisheries management. Then there was a tourism and cultural exchange, science, academic technology. So these these were the six priority areas which were identified when India was the chair. and that was the start of basically doing the things systematically but even before that when iora was established in 1997 member states have been talking about environment member states have been talking about the marine economy marine resources all those things were there uh, in the uh, uh, in the discussion then basically we had three core group meetings three ministerial conferences on blue economy one first was held in uh mauritius the second was held in indonesia the third was held in 2019 in bangladesh 
in during this blue economy ministerial we focused on uh, the commitment to the blue economy so and then we also identified uh, certain sectors in the blue economy and uh, shipping and uh, port and ship building then basically is a fish, uh, fishing and aquaculture so then basically tourism so there were six six areas which we identified under the blue economy and in that case basically uh, at uh, at the world level basically the the issues were raised regarding the uh, inclusion of lakes cities and other seas that is i'm referring to the very important conference on blue economy which was held in november 2018 in which i made two presentation so there the united nations special envoy peter Thiem, uh, thomas basically talked about uh, uh, linking this uh, blue economy to the cities to the coastal areas as well as to the climate change and now basically very recently i submitted a paper the case of blue economy uh, for the landlocked countries so there also basically in terms on of unclosed Uh, uh, regulations and uh, articles i try to show that uh, the achievement of the global sustainable development goal can be done only if we try to include the landlocked countries also now if you take it to south asia in which there are eight countries and there are you see uh, three or four countries for example afghanistan bhutan nepal so these are the countries basically which uh, which are landlocked countries and uh, uh basically oh, you have another five go... minutes sorry for the interruption you have another five minutes okay you, okay thank you so in that case basically now let me come back to the uh the indian uh indian blue economy case so the blue economy basically uh the uh, in india is being guided by the visionary and dynamic leadership of our prime minister narendra modi he gave the concept of sagar and uh, basically he tried to define this blue economy that blue economy means a blue revolution and the potential of the blue economy for india is represented by the uh, the blue circle in our national flag so that is basically blue economy has a potential for india in terms of port led development in which the present government is investing billions of dollar which will be making our international trade cost effective trade cost will be reduced then the other aspect which is there basically even in case of uh, uh, india and iora basically and then i remember i was here and i attended that meeting prime minister modi came uh, in march 2015 uh, in mauritius and then he went to seychelles so the another thing which is very important that is the the cooperation in blue economy which can be led by india at sub regional level the other thing which i want to tell that is the accelerated technological change artificial intelligence so all these th things basically are in abundance in india so india basically has the potential to uh, to utilize this blue economy and to become uh, a country which can achieve the double digit growth rate as well as uh, basically uh, can help the other countries to realize or to harness the vast oceanic resources which are available in their exclusive economic zone and lastly basically a very important point that is basically the blue economy whether you call blue economy whether you call it ocean economy whether you call it green blue economy basically depends upon or defines the utilization of local resources local coastal resources to promote localization and to ensure it for the benefit of the people so in that context the vision of the prime minister in terms of atmanirbhar bharat means that we are utilizing the local resources in our coastal areas for the benefit of the people in india as well as we are trying to get the strength build the economy of india to assist the other uh, uh, other regional countries or other neighboring countries uh, so that there is basically uh, the peace and the prosperity in the indian ocean region so it has a national perspective and it has a international perspective then the other thing which is basically which has a, 
been uh, uh, identified by the COVID-19, that is the concentration of global supply chain by one or two countries. So that global supply chain needs to be diversified. And there should be many actors. So that also merges with the concept of uh, Indo-Pacific. So, and the concept of Sagarmala, the concept of Sagar, that is the uh, security and growth for all in the region, these are the building blocks which can take our country at the top and the country can help the other countries. Basically, uh, this, is a, that's, this is an era in which multilateral cooperation is the only way to lead to the prosperity. And in that, blue economy has the potential to achieve the higher and uh, uh, faster rate of growth, uh, basically having productive employment, employing our youth, and not only the youth at national level, but also contributing to the other regional economies and thus leading to uh, the pathways. Here, I'll be ending with the quote uh, of uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, professor, Professor Kinderberger, who in 70s wrote that future belongs to the developing countries and the path which uh, lies for the prosperity of the human being that is the multilateralism and collaborative and cooperative cooperation. Of course, blue economy also have maritime safety dimensions, which you have been discussing uh, for all the uh, two, uh, two days. I won't be commenting on that. And in the last, basically, I will say that uh, blue economy has a great potential and uh, uh, it is a scientific idea. And what is required that uh, if we do not embrace uh, Industrial Revolution 4, which has been emphasized in the UN conference, which I attended in Mexico, that accelerated technological change or technological led growth models are the future uh, of the uh, developing, developed as well as emerging economies. And in that case, India can take the lead. India can acquire the double digit growth rate, more employment, uh, and also basically the security dimensions, collaborative dimensions. So that is basically there is a great hope, great potential and great role for India. What I call, I'm writing a book on that blue economy at global level or what is the role of blue diplomacy. So this is the A's for blue diplomacy and we should strengthen the blue diplomacy in increasing the, uh, you say, security uh, uh, India basically is the net security provider in the Indian Ocean region. The security aspect, which is uh, interlinked with the blue economy, as well as the blue economy potential in, uh, uh, in the post-COVID fight and leading to the prosperity, stability of the Indian Ocean region. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Atal, for the outstanding presentation, which revolved around the, you know, the blue circle within the national flag. So it's so central to whatever we do as a developing country. Uh, unfortunately, due to time constraints, uh, we will not be able to take up the questions immediately. We'll club all the questions together towards the end of the session. And uh, all the questions can only be put in the chat box. Uh, there will be no verbal interaction with the speaker. Uh, I hope you will bear with that. Uh, with that, now let me turn over to uh, Captain Ghosh, Dr. Ghosh, who is a former co-chair and India rep to CSCAP International Study Groups. Uh, he is MBA, he is MA, MSc, PhD, he is a former SEAS fellow and has had the rare privilege of being the lead co-chairman and India representative to consecutive CSCAP international study groups on maritime security. That's within the Council of Security Cooperation in Asia Pacific region uh, in the track two version of ASEAN Regional Forum. And also during which he along with delegates from nearly 22 countries prepared a two memorandum of forwarded to year of summit matters. He's also served in many think tanks in India and was a senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation and earlier a research fellow and the de facto research in charge of the National Maritime Foundation, which is well represented here today and was also represented yesterday uh, by various uh, scholars from there. And he held the prestigious Professor D.S. Kothari DRDO chair at the USI. And uh, you know, I look forward to your talk uh, Captain Ghosh, I always call him Dada Ghosh. So Dada, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you so very much, sir. Um, at the very uh, outset, I would like to uh, thank, uh, it feels so nice to be part of this uh, 
really great event. And I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially uh, Kamal Rao, Uday Rao, who got me into this. And of course, the chair, whom I've known for so many years, uh, both at ORF and at NMF. Um, without uh, further ado, sir, I'd like to request you to tell me uh, when it is five minutes, as you've done for Professor Atri, so that I'm aware of uh, what, uh, how, how much to go ahead. I'll do that, Dada. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, Ashwara, can we have the slides, please? I found that my iPad was not uh, really formatting my presentation properly. So I request uh, Ashwarya to kindly uh, share my slides. Yes, sir. Just a moment, please. Thank you. Um, so I'll be speaking on uh, Sagarmala. Um, uh, some things of Sagarmala I've been tracking since long and uh, how big and how uh, incredible this project is, I'll be trying to get across to you. Uh, since this event is uh, looking at China to a large extent, I will also introduce um, the Chinese element in the sense that how do we compare with them? Uh, I'll also get into what is the current status of the Sagar Mala, because that's what I've been asked to speak on. And uh, uh, there's not much literature available on this, but through RTIs, etc., we have been trying to get uh, the current status. So I will be um, speaking on these. Now, what was the aspect which really led us to this uh, huge uh, program? Uh, I'll not speak too much on the ad nauseum statistics uh, that is usually um, brandied about the 7,500 kilometers uh, coastline for 14,500 kilometers of navigable waterways, 95% by volume, 70% by, uh, uh, by value of Indian exports by sea, etc. But what is important is, uh, next please, uh, what is important is that um, our efficiency is, if I may use um, a, a word uh, rather bad or rather abysmal, uh, the turnaround time for India is about 2.5 days. Uh, this is 2018-2019 figures. And the global average is one to two days. And uh, uh, in, of course, in ports like Mundra and Gangavaram, it is about two days, but that's not really good enough. So 87% um, of our freight goes by ro road or rail. And if you see, what is the reason why it goes by ro road and rail? See how expensive it is from this slide. How really expensive it is. Uh, road rail, in fact, is one of the most expensive. Waterways is cheapest, but only 6% uh, of the Indian freight goes by um, uh, waterways. In the case of China, uh, it is about 47%. Now, there is a bit of a dispute uh, regarding this figure because I also found figures which said that's about 40 and one more figure which said it's about 38, but I have put 47%. That's why I've highlighted it in red. Japan, 34 and U.S., 12.4%. Now, if you see this, our rank in the World Logistic Performance Index is a lowly 35th. And um, that is why uh, in terms of efficiency, cost, sustainability, safety, uh, we, have, we pay very high cost for our services. Now, this is the reason why we thought of uh, Sagarmala. And the vision was this. Next. The vision was essentially to reduce these logistic costs. Now, reduce the cost of transportation, uh, reduce the essential logistic cost, 
and domestic uh, for domestic and international trade and this is the uh, thought process which went behind it um it was originally mooted in 2003 but it finally came about in 2015 and in this the government plans about six new ports across five coastal states and it is going to be married to to an extent with the bharat mala which is the road network now um come next please now what are the pillars of uh, uh sagar mala this is of course port modernization port connectivity port led industrialization and coastal community development uh, i have put these three over here in a figurative form uh, the next slide gives you the details of how to argument capacity of port modernization new ports which i told you efficiency which is most important then connectivity uh, the our last mile connectivity is absolutely abysmal so we have got to get that upgradation of roads inland waterways logistic parks uh, then of course in the, the port led industrialization we must connect the industrial centers to the ports and uh, in that context um, we are going to have uh, maritime clusters of these uh, um, the, these industrial industries i'll be coming to that slightly later and scz's etc uh, the other thing is we have not forgotten the community uh, skill development for the coastal community coastal tourism development of fishing etc now this is uh um, um very important next please in this i have listed out uh, basically what I, i said just now so i won't spend too much time on this except to say that sagarmala also provides an impetus to move cargo through an environmental friendly inland waterways and uh, later on question answer session we can take it up in much more detail next now what are the components of sagarmala if you see over here it was originally 577 projects um uh, with something like 130 billion dollars worth of projects uh in 2015 when it had come up i had propounded a detailed paper uh, i was looking into the bri of the chinese at that time it was known as bri or rather obor and now it is of course known as bri um and i had suggested that we take the money from these chinese banks and use it for our project in those days of course china was not such a big taboo as it is now um and then of course the minister said that look we are not really um hankering for funding because funding will be coming to us and i'll be covering as to how the funding will be coming to us um so uh these are the projects i've listed about port modernization 245 how much do they cost uh, it's about 5 trillion rupees connectivity uh, 2.8 trillion rupees port linked industrialization 5.2 trillion rupees coastal development uh, again uh, 75 billion 577 projects now of course there has been a change in the number of projects as for the latest this thing are only 500 projects that we are looking at next please yes this is of course um, before i go on to the in institutional framework i would just like to mention a bit about the port modernization uh, because that is important and that is what we are all very directly involved with uh, by 2025 we wanted to um, upgrade our capacity to 2500 million tons per year our current capacity is about uh, a little bit about uh, 1500 so it was quite a significant jump but we wanted to increase the capacity to 3500 by 225 the amount would have been 2500 but we wanted excess capacity the sad 
and it was to be done partly under the unnati uh, uh, efficiency um, uh, initiative in all the 12 major ports but um, we could only unlock about 100 million tons per annum and uh, there were 86 initiatives which were implemented and it would give us a benefit of 80 uh, mpta which is a far cry from the 3500 that we hope to see now our um, in the institutional framework is what uh, we are to, this is just to give you an idea of how the sagar mala will be working we will be creating czs that is uh, um, um, the coastal economic uh, zones which will have coastal economic units and the spvs a diagrammatic representation is given over here if you want me to go into greater details we can discuss it during the question hour period but i am not uh, going too much in details of this but this is generally and all this is going to be closely coordinated with the state sagarmala committees and the state level spvs so this is just for a rough idea since the uh, subject is very large i'm sorry i'm just skimming over some of the issues uh, just giving a little bit of details only in some of them which are directly related to us the next one please yeah they have created the sagar uh, mala development company to carry out this entire initiative of course the various ministries are going to carry it out separately but this was uh, the main nodal ministry as far as the ministry of shipping and transport was concerned and uh, this was also supposed to implement not only the Uh, this thing, which is uh, like I said, responsibility of the various ministries, but also the residual projects, which couldn't be funded in other uh, in other fashion fashions. Next. Now I said we uh, will talk about the Chinese example, in which case it was Shenzhen which actually led uh, the way, and we looked up to Shenzhen. And if you just read through this, you will see what a phenomenal. Success it was for the Chinese. It was set up in eighty. They built up the infrastructure up to eighty six, and the value of exports jumped from nine hundred million in nineteen seventy eight seventy nine to one zero one five one eight million in two thousand five. I purposely read out that entire thing. Rather than saying so many billion, because you come to know how much it has jumped, and not only that, it has given them less reliance on Hong Kong and on Taiwan, and the entire ecosystem has been built. Something which we are sadly lacking. So I think uh, we need to learn from the Chinese in these aspects. Next, what do we hope to achieve by? Uh, Sagar Mala by 2025, which is not very far, as you can see. Now, Dr. Goshi, you have another five minutes. Okay, sir. So, if you just go through this, you will see how much of an impact Sagar Mala will have on port modernization. I have given all the figures. Um, the logistic saving will be to the tune of 35,000 to 40,000 crores. Uh, it will reduce the time of exports by five days. Uh, the number of waterways will double and hopefully we will be able to boost our exports um to 110 billion us dollars uh 40 lakh direct jobs will be created by this um next please so this is what we hope to achieve where are we i will just tell you as far as uh, coastal Community development is concerned. Uh, we had hoped to train. There are sixty-five projects of seventy-three billion. We had hoped to train ten thousand people in three years, but we have trained only about one nine one seven candidates with uh, one thousand one hundred twenty-three in line. Of course, we have set up centers. We are pretty good at that. Multi-skill center at JNPT, the National Tech Center for Ports and Waterways at IIT, which will help the inland waterways. and we are also trying to push the coastal tourism but where we are 
is a matter of debate, as I show you now. Um, I will not. Next, please. Yeah, uh, I don't think I have the time. I would have loved to cover the funding aspect because that's really incredible. Uh, how we are also trying to go to for uh, dollar dominated roles, loans, and go, uh, getting to the development bank financing, something which only JNPT and Adani have done, but we were trying to do it for all the others. Next. Uh, most of it was supposed to be PPP, but unfortunately, we have still got to build up the ecosystem around the PPPs, which we haven't done. As I've told you, plan 91 projects, 35 have been completed and 27 are under construction. Um, only two have been terminated. Next. Uh, this, I had given the year-wise funding requirement for all the projects. It's obviously a bit dense. So I will leave the, uh, my presentation. People can go through it. Uh, one has to go through with probably a magnifying glass to go into details of each project and how much it costs and what has. So let me quickly come to the status. Um, next, please. And next. Yeah, uh, my last two, three slides is, this is what the Minister of Shipping informed the Lok Sabha. Implementation, as of now, 500 projects, not 577 that we started off from. 143 projects have been completed and 190 are under completion. Remaining 167 are under various stages. Uh, he says, of course, uh, it'll all be completed by 2035. He's obviously very optimistic because it's his uh, baby. Uh, I am not too sure. Uh, the implementation mechanism I've given all state governments, maritime boards, SPZ, uh, SPVs. But uh, like I said, next. Uh, this is the current status. I've put it down in a small thing of 500 where is the current uh, each project in under the main headings port modernization connectivity etc so this i have given this is the most important uh, slide so to say unfortunately i can't keep it on for long uh, the next slide please yes now really speaking as per business standard this is another of a i won't say lame duck but a hobbling duck and only one projects have been completed since uh, 2016. 50 projects were 140 completed. 212 projects are still left. They are facing considerable um, problems with respect to land acquisition. And the RTI on the matter says the matter uh, data is not available. In fact, the Karnataka uh, High Court has stayed the phase two of the Karwar port. So things are not as hunky-dory as one would like them to be. My last slide is, uh, I just thought I will speak on the disadvantages. Um, next one. Another aspect which has come up again and again is that there is a strong movement that is being created saying that it is damaging the humane and sustainable perspective in coastal India. And it is generating a lot of ecological uh, problems. Uh, the National Fish Workers Forum, the they're not a main uh, body, as one would say, but they are slowly building up. The National Alliance of People's Movement have stated that all these projects are being cleared environmentally without much thought. So we have got to give it more thought and more research but how, how much that is going to be possible, I'm not sure. But overall, I think that Sagarmala is an incredible project, even if it doesn't come up um, by 2035. If we reach the aim that we had set out to reach, uh, to reach I think we would have reached a long way. And India, uh, the ma entire maritime sector of India, especially the commercial one, will see a new horizon. Uh, with that, I uh, thank uh, thank you all for the patient listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh.
Hello, in the first session we heard Professor Rafi talking about the centrality of our wheel. I really complimented it by looking at how these wheels of progress can be moved forward. So, uh, thank you so much, but we will reserve uh, after the, all the three speakers have uh, spoken for the question and answer session. Uh, with this, I request now uh, uh, Professor Sundaraman, Shakri Sundaraman, to take over the floor. I'll be briefly <coughs> Not that she is uh, not known to others here, but uh, for many of them who may be seeing her for the first time. Yeah. Uh, can others kindly uh, switch off their uh, mics? It's, it's a distraction. Please mute yourself, except for the speaker. Uh, professor Shankar Sindaraman is a professor of Southeast Asian Studies and has served twice as the chairperson at the Center for Interpersonal Studies, School of International Studies, and the JNU. She joined the JNU in 2003. And prior to this, she worked as research officer and research fellow at the IDSA, which is now redesignated as uh, Mano Manohar Parikar mm -hmm. IDSA. And this is from 1962-2003. She was a visiting fellow at the Asia Pacific College of Diplomacy, APCD, at the Australian National University, Canberra, from uh, May to July 2005, where she worked on the trilateral relations between India, Indonesia, and Australia, all of them have become important to the calculations in the Pacific today. She is also a visiting fellow at the Centre for Strategic International Studies, CSIS, Jakarta, <coughs> and as a recipient of the Asia Fellows Award funded by the Ford Foundation. Professor Sundaraman has also been part of several track two initiatives to Southeast Asia and Australia. She has several publications to her credit in journal, in articles, in chapters, in books, media, and website commentary as well as a book title, Cambodia, The Last Decade. She is on the editorial board of two international journals, the Strategic Analysis, IDSA, and the Journal of Truth Practice. She is also a visiting faculty and adjunct professor at the Naval War College in Goa. Of course, she did not come to Naval War College in Bombay <laughs> in because she likes Goa better. With that, over to you, Professor Kari. All the best. Thank you. Minutes. Thank you. Have you 15 minutes. So that you can wind up in time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. I think um, anybody would say that Goa far out trumps Bombay and Mumbai. So I think I can't be blamed for choosing Goa as a better option. But um, I promise to continue to stay associated with the Naval War College as long as they want me to be there. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, wonderful to be here um, at this session. I'm sorry for missing yesterday's um, if, you know, day's program, I was at another webinar and this has become the, the work from home. I was actually sharing it with director Shashi Nair that work from home has become work beyond time zones, you know. So in that sense, it's been difficult. So at the outset, uh, my sincere thank you to the Press Institute of India, especially to director Shashi Nair. Um, he has personally reached out to me over the course of the last few months, asking me to be involved and engaged with the programs that are being jointly hosted by these three organizations. Um, as Commodore Vasan has already said in the introduction, we've known each other for several years now, and it's wonderful to be part of your institute's work. And um, my greetings to both you as well as to Sri Heblikar uh, and to your two institutions that are jointly hosting this event today. Um, the paper that I'm supposed to be presenting today is on the ASEAN responses to the South China Sea issue. And um, what I would do is to sort of raise a few is aspects of the South China Sea issue, because I know there are lots of young participants in the program. And I'm, I want to actually say that I'm amazed that there are nearly 70 people uh, online for this event. And I think it's a, it's a clear indication of the success of your participation in this program, because you know, to have people at a time like um, this, what we're going through an unprecedented time and to have 70 participants is excellent. So let me begin by sort of uh, sharing my in a little bit of views on what I think are the relevant matters, which many of you already know, but for the younger participants will be very critical. That if you take the South China Sea region per se, I think the con context of its geo, geo uh, strategic importance becomes extremely relevant from two significant angles. First and foremost, this is the area uh, which is an important aspect of the regional security architecture as it becomes the interconnected um, you know, oceanic extents that connect the Indian and the Pacific Ocean, which we are today repeatedly being calling as the Indo-Pacific. 
The second context is that the South China Sea per, per se is a critical sea line of communication. And if you take the context of the choke points in this area, you have the Malacca, the Sunda, the Lombok, the Makassar, as well as the Ombai Straits. All five of these straits are extremely critical to the region of Southeast Asia. And um, even though we are looking at it as the Indo-Pacific, the context of Southeast Asia's relevance, which is why I chose to work on ASEAN's response to the South China Sea conflict, the context of Southeast Asia's relevance remains excessively critical for us in the region. So the strategic relevance, therefore, of this waterway becomes is important because of two aspects, both from the context of the security matters that are there in the region, as well as the, you know, the economic implications that are based from this entire focus on the South China Sea itself. So in that sense, what I see is that the South China Sea today has overlap, overlapping sovereignty claims particularly over the features of the Spratleys and the Parasol group of islands. And what you see is that after a rather complex and um, uh, I would say an intricate kind of a colonial legacy, what you see is today there are asserted claims of territorial sovereignty over these waters and territorial sovereignty over the islands per se. So in that context, I think it's important for us to understand that in terms of the relevance of this region, um, the, U, the U, United Nations Conference on Trade and Development has actually identified that nearly 30% of the global trade passes through the waters of the Indo-Pacific through the route of the South China Sea. And for India, it's in even more because 55% of India's trade passes through these waters. And if you take the context of energy resource per se, then about 60% of energy passes through these waters. Now, how then, if we are deciphering, as the theme of this conference is, the maritime context of China's involvement, how then do we bring that thematic context into this entire notion of how we identify and view the South China Sea? Because as far as the uh, volume of, say, energy supplies that pass through the region from Chinese perspective is concerned, 80% of China's energy requirements are met through imports that cross through the South China Sea. And about 40% of Chinese trade also passes through this region. So in that context, I think what becomes relevant is that if we bring it to the present context, China's economic growth that has been one of the sustaining features of its rise and not so peaceful rise, if I may add, as well as the reliance on this unlimited source of energy that the Chinese are continuing to seek. I think what will be important is for us to understand that for the Chinese, the the option of an unlimited source of energy supply is going to be critical and therefore many of the issues that you are seeing today comes from that premise that this region becomes predominantly an area of Chinese security interests. So how it's affecting the rest of the region is extremely uh, you know, uh, relevant and it's going to be extremely vital for us therefore as scholars to look at it. So I, um, I recall that the Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative also speaks about the uh, resources that are there in the South China Sea itself because these resources are also critical. There is an estimated about 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas about 11 million barrels of oil that are proved and provable, probable reserves, as they call it, the probable and the proved reserves. So this becomes extremely critical for um, the region itself in terms of how the conflict in the South China Sea is going to be managed. To give a little insight into the historical factor, what I would like to do is to look at the claims itself, because as if you go back itself in the 1930s, the French government was actually in control of the Spratlys and the Parasols. But if you go back previously in 1843, the Vietnamese claimed that they were in control even as early as the 17th century. Um, so it is interesting to see this entire context that, um, you know, this uh, 1843 is when they were actually uh, discovered, but Vietnamese claims go back to the 17th century. So if you take the 
uh, for me, the clear-cut evidence that I would uh, sort of rely on is from 1939, when the Japanese Imperial Army actually occupied the South China Sea uh, Islands as a part of their measure in their occupation of Southeast Asia during the war. And in 1947, after Japan's surrender, the uh, Japanese were actually stripped of their possessions of the Spratleys and the Paracels. And it again, um, in by, the, by the time the PRC began to claim it in the 1951 treaty negotiations, the question of the conflict of the South China Sea and the island areas remained largely unresolved. And it's very interesting to see there is an interesting caveat which I noticed from a Southeast Asian perspective because coming from the context of the area studies of Southeast Asia, I want to bring that relevance back into the debate is that, you know, when you see the first Indochina war itself, which is when the Vietnamese were fighting for their uh, you know, nationalist movement under the French colonial period, you see that in the end of the first Indochina war, which is actually dated with the end of the Geneva, Geneva Accord of 1954, Vietnam was actually divided into two portions of the North and South Vietnam. And interestingly, the southern portions of Vietnam were to acquire the territories of the South China Sea Islands. And it's interesting because the Chinese at this point were claiming these areas. And North Vietnam at this time actually supported the Chinese claims as the legal owner of the South China Sea Islands. And this was because given the dichotomy between the North and the South, the North Vietnamese forces wanted to support the Chinese position vis-a-vis -vis the South Vietnamese portions, which were already being supported by the United States presence in the region. So by 1974, when the, his, when the course of Vietnam's history began, began to be more clear, what you see is that by which time China and North Vietnam had actually started to move away from each other and the Sino-Soviet split had occurred. The Vietnamese were closer, the Northern Vietnamese were much closer to the USSR at that time. And as well as the Sino-US rapprochement had also started leading to, you know, the US agreeing to Chinese occupation of some portions of these islands. And it's very interesting that when you see the larger context of the regional game that took place in this context, you, you see that much of the South China Sea issue remained unresolved in this context. So if we have to look at the origins of the nine dash line, I think the first um, um, emphasis of this was actually done by the Republic of China, not the People's Republic of China, the ROC. And in, in as early as I think it was 1947 that the ROC came up with a map that actually showed what is today the controversial nine dash line, which is a kind of a cul-de-sac kind of a line that roughly covers about 80% of the waters. Now, if you also take the uh, context of the claims by other ASEAN countries, uh, let me say that as early as the later half of the 70s, the Philippines and the Malaysian states started to claim islands in their own region. And it, this became even more concrete after the 1982 UNCLOS, because on the basis of UNCLOS, I think two countries, that is both Malaysia and Brunei, began to look at the South China Sea as uh, the islands of that region as their own areas. Now, interestingly, what you also see is by 1978, um, the Philippines had issued a presidential decree. And according to this decree, the island of Kalayayan which island, which is pro, pro part of the Spratly Island group, that began to be seen as Philippine territory. Now, Brunei also has a claim to what is known as three areas. That is, it's, I think, the Louisa Reef, the Owen Shoal, as well as what is called the Rifleman Bank. Now, all these three are claimed by the Brunei uh, government as part of their territory. But it's interesting that none of uh, both Brunei and Malaysia, however, claim it. And of course, the Vietnamese also have a large claim in the context of the South China Sea, both in the Spratlys and the Paracels. Now, why does ASEAN therefore fit into the context of the debate? I think there are two ways in which we can assess the ASEAN role in the context of the South China Sea debate. The first is that um, there are four countries that are basically claimant states, as I've already said, Brunei, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And there are three other countries that are, I would say, Singapore, Indonesia, and um, Thailand, for example, which are non-claimant countries of the South China Sea. But the efforts of these three countries has been to 
um, try and broker an honest kind of a peace, play the role of an honest peace broker, I would say, in the context of the conflict. And if you take countries like, for example, Laos and Cambodia, I think what you have seen in the recent about the last decade or so is that these countries have moved significantly closer to uh, the Chinese uh, position. And what you see is that these countries have actually not allowed for, particularly Cambodia, have not allowed for any kind of a movement to take place in terms of a resolution. Uh, Professor Shankar, we have another five minutes. Sorry to interrupt you. That's, we have another five I minutes. Will, uh, sir, can you please give me a few more minutes because I have a couple of points which I really All want right. to raise. I'll wrap seven it up in about seven minutes time. All right, seven All right. minutes. Thank you. So, Thank you. So um, what um, I want to just point out is that in terms of resolution, what has been ASEAN's efforts, I would say that the first concrete effort at resolution came at the 25th ASEAN ministerial meeting in 1992. And the focus was at that time to have an international code of conduct over the South China Sea and also to ensure that its resolution was based on the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation and broadly within the framework of the United Nations uh, uh, Convention on Law of the Sea. So where does the um, question therefore stand? I think for almost about till 2002, I'm going to wrap it up uh, very quickly so that I can take some of the issues in the question and answer given the time factor. So until 2002, I think broadly this was the strategy that the ASEAN followed, that repeatedly the emphasis was on moving towards a regional code of conduct. In 2002, you see that China and ASEAN actually drafted what is called a declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea. And this declaration was one of the eventual uh, processes that has still been in a limbo because from 2002 till about a decade later, that is by 2012, it was supposed to be formulated into what is called the um, uh, a, a binding code of conduct. However, the most critical year has been 2012 because in the 2012 ASEAN summit, they were not able to pass a joint communique by, because by then the Chinese had actually managed to split the ASEAN almost into uh, what you call the salami slicing of ASEAN, as they call it, where Cambodia became um, um, reticent about passing any resolution that would be carrying anything against the Chinese in terms of how it would happen. So the concrete years, in my view, are 2012 and significantly also in 2016, when the permanent court of arbitration actually came up with a resolution on the Philippines having gone to the PCA, which ruled that which ruled first and foremost in favor of the Philippines. And more importantly, it ruled that the context of the Chinese claims on the basis of historicity does not actually prevail within the context of the uh, international legal uh, space. So that itself, I think, has been very, very critical a factor. Now, if I come to the six point agenda per se, I think there is an important factor that the agenda, I will just quickly say what is the agenda and three of the factors are very important. One is fully respect the universally recognized principles of international law, particularly under the UNCLOS. The second is the question of the question of exercising self-restraint and non-use of force, which I think those of you who are following the events in the region will already know that that is not being adhered to at all, particularly from the Chinese side. I think the third context is the whole issue of a peaceful resolution of the entire context. So nearly two decades after the signing of the uh, what you call the DOC, where do we currently stand? I think it's even though it's been two decades, there is no movement forward on this entire context of a binding code of conduct. Now, the critical aspect of this binding code of conduct was that the binding code of conduct was supposed to move towards what is called a single draft code of conduct, which has not happened because the single draft code of conduct has actually, what it has thrown out to most of us is the fact that there have been several areas on which the Chinese as well as the um, um, ASEAN states have not been able to come towards any kind of a resolution. The, 
context is therefore in terms of let me come to the recent ASEAN summit so that I can conclude with that and the ARF meeting. So it is very clear that over 18 years, the context of moving forward on the single draft code of conduct has actually not met with much success. So in June 2020, when the 36th summit of the ASEAN has actually taken place, one of the binding factors, which I think has stood out very clearly as far as the South China Sea is concerned, is that this year's joint communique actually very clearly highlighted that all 10 members of ASEAN are actually in favor of resolving the conflict according to the principles and tenets of the United Nations Convention on Law of the Seas. This itself has been a huge step forward as far as the ASEAN countries are concerned, because given China's you know, salami slicing of the region, I think what ASEAN has been able to do is to finally come out with one version of a communique where all 10 members have agreed to this in the context of the South China Sea. In significantly later in August 2020 also, the ARF meeting has clearly again identified the question of the South China Sea and the COC being the code of conduct being the more most important aspect. Now, in terms of um, this, where does it stand currently? As we've seen during the pandemic, and this will be my concluding point because I think almost my five minutes are up. The, during the pandemic, what we have seen is that there has been a dual strategy as far as the context of China is concerned. What the Chinese have basically done is to, on the one hand, they have used the entire opportunity of the pandemic to further and in, you know, uh, push their humanitarian assistance to the region. The Chinese have been the most, um, the, have done the maximum in terms of humanitarian assistance, particularly for the Southeast Asian countries, not just the Chinese state-owned companies, but also private firms like Jack Ma's firm have also given tremendous aid to the context of assistance in the region. On the one hand, this soft power has also been pushed by the Chinese. At the same time, if you look at the kind of aggressive posturing that has happened in the region, there is a duality of approach by which China has played its game as far as the pandemic is concerned. Now, this is a very critical factor because the context of international behavior at a time when a, a global pandemic is under, uh, you know, currently underway has exhibited the kind of emphasis that the Chinese are uh, laying to the region in terms of a Sinocentric evol evolution towards what they see as the region. So I think this is one of the credible factors. I think um, uh, as we look at the region, the question of ASEAN centrality is coming under, repeatedly coming under threat. And I think the context of ASEAN centrality will be very critical. And how ASEAN manages its own centrality, given that it has a lot of divis divisions within itself, is going to be one of the more critical factors. I'll stop with this in lieu of time and take up other issues in the question and answer. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Shankari. It was an outstanding presentation. In fact, uh, you, many in the audience, you know, wanted me to extend this session a little more so could, they could hear you. But I'm sure you'll use that opportunity you, during the question and answer session. Uh, so it was an outstanding talk thank you in terms of understanding the relevance of ASEAN. You know, in fact, some people must be wondering as to how we clubbed you along with two other speakers. You know, we are discussing <laughs> comprehensive national power, but you know, there are other time constraints. Exactly. Also, your availability. But the fact that you brought out makes it very important for us to understand that you cannot have comprehensive maritime national power without dealing with blocks, without dealing with your neighbors, without dealing with the dynamics of uh, development, uh, ASEAN vis a vis China. So, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. With that, I'll throw open thank the you. floor for the question and answer. As usual, I also request the uh, those who are presented to kindly look at the chat box so that they are aware of what questions have been posed. However, Asheria will facilitate the process of putting all the questions together and addressing them to all the three speakers. Who can respond in one go uh, instead of taking up each questions? You may kindly make a note of the questions that are being posed to you so that you can respond together and link them up. Thank you very much. Asheria, over to you. Yes, sir. just a moment. Uh, so I will read out uh, all the questions and um, um, th there are many questions for uh, for Dr. Uh, B.K. Ghosh. I will read all the questions uh, and uh, name the uh, the speaker it's addressed to as well. 
and uh, and go forward from there sir just a minute all right uh, before that uh, dr ghosh have you made a note of the questions in the chat box uh, hello i've already no, made a note then there is no need to read it you can go to go and go ahead and say your response to the questions i'll i'll just go yeah that be better we'll save some time we are running behind time so i'd request your help in ensuring that you look at the chat box and respond to the questions together okay so so um first question is uh, addressed to uh, professor um, Pro professor shankari um, and it's posed by um, pratap hablikar sir the question reads uh, requesting yes. to enlighten us on india's decision not to join our rcep mm. and its impact on india's uh, uh, india's and regional security especially irrawaddy uh, transit uh, corridor being developed by china uh, this question can be fielded by other speakers um, another question um, uh, uh, for uh, professor uh, uh, shankari is uh, posed by commodore venugopal uh, and the question reads there is increasing apprehensions that china would push the code of conduct through uh, through uh, through based on their uh, uh, interest before uh, philippines relinquish the chair i'm sorry relinquish before the uh, philippines relinquish the chair comments please um another question for professor shankari is uh, posed by vice admiral uh, b kannan the question reads um would china reduce its present over presence over um, uh dependence on sea lanes uh, through indian ocean by developing um, alternative sea routes through arctic zone um the, those are the questions for um uh, professor shankri and there are there's uh, there are two more questions for you ma'am uh, another question by um, uh, vice admiral murli daran is um, will china uh, uh, will Can china I? yes sir yes ma'am sorry ashwari i don't mean to interrupt can we just take them uh, a bunch at a time rather than all the questions i'll open it in my chat box okay okay ma'am uh because um, otherwise because in this format responding is very different because in a normal format it's different yes ma'am yes yeah may so, i just please then let let uh, should i go first uh okay ma'am okay um or should we wait in the same order with professor no, atri no i suggest i suggest you go ahead and finish it and then we'll allow professor atri and uh, uh, dr ghosh to comment because all, all right thank you please go ahead all right okay, Let, okay. thank you so much thank you um first for my foremost i think the question raised by shri heblikar i think on the um, the china myanmar irrawaddy trunk economic corridor i think if you take the irrawaddy corridor per se it's a part of the chinese uh, bri okay and the idea is that they want to connect shanghai to kunming and then from kunming they want to go through the route of the uh, shan state and then from the shan state into the region of bamo it's very interesting when you know when i look at the chinese bri what i actually find is that it's a reverse of the colonial uh, process where the co colonial powers extended their overland route into china into inland china through areas of burma and today the chinese are using the same reverse pattern in reverse to extend their route outside so what i find is it is actually a fascinating uh, what you call reversal of history that is actually taking place when we look at the bri per se the question of the rcep in my mind i think india did the right thing not signing the rcep and this is because if you take the rcep per se i think if you I, there's about 100 and i've recently written a piece that will be published in the uh, website of the kalinga international foundation this should come out in a, another day or so i guess so that piece actually argues that if you take the level of um, trade deficit that india already has with the rcep countries there are 11 countries of the rcep members with whom india already has a trade deficit okay people have argued that this was one of the way for us to integrate further particularly on the economic front with the region my sense is that yes for the asean countries i think there's a way that we have to look at this and my argument is that 
I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of ambient noise. Can anybody please put off their uh, mics while I'm speaking, please? Thank you. Um, see, um, what I would like to sort of state is that the context of the RCEP becomes very critical because when you take the RCEP per se, the debate is not between whether ASEAN wants us in the RCEP both as economic or security partners, but also the debate is between India's domestic politics and its commitment to regional integration. If your commitment to regional integration outweighs what is happening domestically, I don't think it's a healthy environment for any government to take up. So as a result, they, there have also been arguments that it will increase our competitiveness. I think the context is our competitiveness is already weak. The very fact that we still have, in spite of the India-ASEAN FTA, if we still have a trade deficit with the ASEAN countries, and we are looking at a larger trade deficit of nearly 150 US billion dollars, I think the context of competitiveness does not occur overnight. So the context is to ensure that your competitiveness is complete before you regionally integrate, which is what other countries have done. So the context is to liberalize internally first before you actually take that liberalization outside. So, and I think this, this, you know, this distinction is being missed in the larger context of how we have actually um, assessed the RCEP. So in that sense, I think the decision on not signing is a pragmatic decision which we have actually adhered to. The second question that I think um, Sri Venugopal Menon has asked me is the entire question on where does China will push the context of the COC through. The Chinese are very clear that the COC will be worked out bilaterally within each country, each of the claimant states with China and then endorsed by the ASEAN. The ASEAN is not comfortable with that framework. The current chair is Vietnam, not the Philippines, and the next chair is likely to be Brunei, and the next chair after Brunei in 2022 will most likely go back to Cambodia. For the, uh, for the ASEAN, the question of resolving this while Vietnam and, and, and Brunei are the chair are more critical because once it goes back to Cambodia, the capacity of China to actually manipulate Cambodian leadership into taking a position that is supportive of the Chinese position is very, very critical. And for the ASEAN, that is not acceptable. In fact, recently, the ASEAN even had a discussion in its 35th ASEAN um, roundtable where one of the leading Singapore uh, diplomats and um, you know, policy makers actually made a passing reference to leaving Cambodia and Laos out of the ASEAN framework in the context of protecting the eight other members. So I think what you're going to see within ASEAN is a lot of churning. And this is directly related to the fact that Cambodia and Laos have come so close to the Chinese position itself. The next question is by uh, Sri Kannan, whose question is on whether the Chinese would be able to reduce their dependence on the Indian Ocean. I do not think the Chinese will reduce their dependence because if you see the fact that 80% of China's energy resources are coming through the Indian Ocean, as well as the Straits of Malacca and the remaining Straits in the region of the Indo-Pacific. The Chinese dependence on this region will remain. What will happen once the Arctic zone is opened is that the Chinese can trade, trade can move through that region, but its entire dependence on its energy resources will still continue to come from the Indian Ocean region is the sense that I get. I, Aishwarya, have I answered the three questions that were addressed to me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You okay. Have, um, so the rest of the participants can go ahead, please. Thank you. Yes. Um, ma'am, there's one more question addressed to you. Uh, uh, okay. Aishwarya, no more questions yes. for uh, Professor yeah, Shaikh. Think... <laughs> that okay. can be responded to in the chat box. Please okay. uh, take up questions for uh, Professor Atri, followed by okay, uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Okay. Sir. Sorry, okay, Professor Shankari, there. I know a lot of questions are for you. Your lecture was so interesting. But we thank you so much. Yeah. No, no, I fully accede to that. Not a problem. OK, sir. Um, the question to uh, Professor uh, Atri is uh, posed by Dr. Bamadev Sigdal. The question reads, how, uh, how could we link blue economy with green economy philosophy for growth adopted by developing countries and Nepal? Um, another question for you, sir, is uh, posed by Prakash Panish Selvan. Uh, the question reads, 
can you explain what kind of capacity building measure india should take in order to strengthen india's cooperation with small island countries okay <clears throat> thank you uh, in fact uh, let me just uh, come to the first question that is uh, how to link the blue economy with the green economy here one thing is that uh, i pose to all the panelists uh, everybody agrees that oceans are important and i as mentioned oceans are under stress the question which needs to be answered can ocean be frontier of uh, next paradigm shift which i raised philosophically can we think that ocean can resolve all the problems and if i go back to the population pressure that is 9.8 billion by 2050 so if we take the technological aspect that says that uh, as guntar pali has put it uh, that uh, it is the age of abundance then there is a contradiction with the economics which is a science of scarcity so can you can you converse that abundance will overcome scarcity whether there will be uh, scarce resources uh, scarcity of resources or not to so that basically the answer still needs to be uh, you see analyzed and uh, i my view is that economics will always be always be there and uh, even if the scientific developments are there you cannot uh, overcome this scarcity the other big issue is who is controlling the accelerated technological change whether it can be used for the benefit of the mankind or it can be diverted the other way the third thing which is basically is and i am coming to the green blue also so green the green blue basically green economy when we talk about that is uh, focusing on the environmental protection in blue economy when we relate it to the ocean we are focusing on the environment protection as well as health of the ocean so basically there are various names green economy blue economy blue growth ocean economy sustainable ocean economy unsustainable economy brown economy but you see there is no contradiction between the blue economy or the green economy and the world bank has uh, uh, is working on the investment portfolios as well as the donor to the world bank on the basis of green blue investment so that is basically whatever we are doing on the land that it is also being done on the ocean also and that is the con conservation of the resources so this is one basically thing and then the second question basically what india needs to do in order to uh, build capacity so the capacity is already there you see technological capacity uh, in india's are there what we needs that is basically uh, the coordination and the key pillar of the blue economy if you see the history of all the successful countries who have been uh, successful in reaping the oceanic resources whether it is a uh, us whether it is china whether it is australia whether it is the scandinavian countries and particularly i am referring to the eu countries they have been successful because they were successful in implementing the marine special planning which is still in making in india you see there was the prime minister economic advisory council meeting in may 2018 which i attended I, and i also contributed paper to the marine special planning so the first thing is the marine special planning needs to be strengthened in case of india and not only in case of india in case of iora also but there are few countries which are working seriously on the marine special planning that contest uh, the indian collaboration with norway is a welcome step so in that case you see basically india is moving forward in having a collaboration with norway which is a, a very big uh, which is a very you see a positive country and which is which have the technology in the use of the sustainable development and the oceanic resources so that basically uh, should be there and then the third thing is that uh, uh, as i mentioned that uh, the prime minister visited the Mauritius, Seychelles, Sri Lanka, 
and then Bangladesh, then some uh, uh, African countries long back 2015 and 16. So we need to create systems. There are systems of system and their system. So that is basically to create the capacity in India to help the SIDS country. We need to focus on innovativeness. We need to focus on systems thinking. So that is the thing which basically I'm focusing on systemic thinking uh, for the solution of the global problems. You see, basically, most of the problem in ocean economy or the green economy or, or the green blue economy or the blue, blue growth is our transboundary in nature. If, whether it is the ocean acidification, whether it is uh, uh, climate change, whether it is the plastic pollution. So in that, in order to solve the, uh, you say, uh, global issues, we need to adopt systemic thinking. And the systemic thinking is the blend of the natural scientist as well as the social scientist, whether you are a lawyer, whether you are a scientist, so all those needs to be clubbed together. So these these are some of the responses. I hope that uh, answers the queries of the uh, participant. Thank you. Well, thank you, sir. Raishabhya, you may now pose the question to uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, who I will request uh, him to be brief in his response. I have seen through them. I have seen through them. I'll answer them. But before that, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, Shankari's uh, excellent presentation, which was absolutely brilliant, but what she didn't mention was that uh, there have been other efforts at conflict resolution at the sea, uh, South China Seas. In fact, I headed a, a delegation to all the claimant countries except Brunei in trying to resolve the issue. And um, of course, nothing much came out of it, obviously. But what did come out of it was the COC. And in fact, the COC draft came to us first when we were much before it was released to the, uh, uh, released the, public. To the public. And exactly. uh, then we discussed it. But that's another story. And this is not uh, the reason why I'm on this seminar. Uh, but we could go on on that. But excellent presentation. Uh, uh, Professor Shankari, the right to respond could be exercised during lunch time, with your permission. <laughs> OK, <laughs> fine. Okay, no, <laughs> yeah. so, so, uh, Dr. Ghosh, please keep your responses brief. We are way yes. behind our schedule. I know. I don't have much time, yeah. so I will not go on to a lengthy. But I'll quickly mention, firstly, Admiral Kanan's uh, 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 question about uh, the internal waterways, uh, which um, are in many ways drying up and absolutely i entirely agree with you sir that um, we have to maintain the uh, internal waterways and there has been a lot of effort in this a lot of effort and in fact um, uh, this should be um, uh, clubbed with admiral ganesh uh, it's very nice to see you over here sir um, Ganesh's question about the rivers not being perennial in many places. That is precisely one of the biggest headaches. And, uh, uh, you know, certain sections of the river are only navigable throughout the year in some of the rivers. And of course, dredging is a very big problem. Uh, um, so upkeep of these waterways is a continuous process which is going on. And the government is aware of it and is looking. And many of the projects deal with this, in fact, even in Sagarmala. A lot of money has gone into this. So this is now how does it um, help the landlocked states? I think uh, uh, it helps. If you look at Shenzhen, uh, these SEZ that came up, of, apart from the fact that its own uh, economy is booming, I think the entire economy of the country is booming. And mind you, um, the Sagar Mala is in many ways not only trying to develop, of course, it is developing the ports and what all I've told you, but it's helping the country's economy. So please don't think that this is only a coastal effort. Of course, all the money, all the projects are going into the coastal effort. But the Bharat Mala takes it on to uh, the, the entire net network of um, continental roads, if I may use the term. So, it you know, there is a lot of reservation by some people about, well, what does Jammu and Kashmir uh, really, or let's take 
uh, what does Rajasthan benefit from Sagar Mala? The entire economy of the country benefits from Sagar Mala. And like we have seen the statistics of how much of our trade goes by sea, etc. So if the trade is increased by $110 billion, I think the country benefits. So this is my point. Uh, now, regarding connecting, uh, Commodore Venugopal has asked about dry ports and wet ports. This is one of the most important things that is being looked into. And there are uh, uh, various initiatives and projects which do that, including connecting uh, them up to the corridors, the industrial corridors. So the impetus is being provided. A lot of money is being generated uh, for um, as funds uh, for these projects. So I'm not going into details. Obviously, I don't have the time. I wish I had. I would have gone into each of the projects to uh, sort of clarify the issue. Uh, lastly, I think uh, Ms. Shah has said about countering the BRI and its finance. As I told you in the presentation, in 2015, I had uh, written uh, a paper on how to take the finances from the BRI uh, developmental banks which were set up. Uh, that, of course, wasn't needed as the minister himself had said. But the idea is not to counter BRI financially in that sense, but to counter BRI as a whole, uh, I think that is more important. So uh, we have got enough funding for our uh, Sagar Mala through various uh, through various projects, through, uh, as I told you, even do dollar-dominated uh, loans, through developmental banks, etc. So I wouldn't really try and say that, look, we are countering the finances of BRI, but uh, the strategic aim should be to counter BRI as a whole rather than the entire finances. Uh, the rest of the questions, I, 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 don't, I don't see any other questions. If there are, I'll, I'll be happy to answer uh, individually. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the three panelists for a wonderful session. You know, I'm reminded of what Professor Surya Narayan tells me. You know, he's part of us. You know, whenever I invite him, he says, all the professors normally take 20 minutes to warm up. And you're asking me to wind up within 20 minutes. And he says, that's not fair. So by that logic, with three professors on this, I have to give one minute, one hour just for warming up. <laughs> so I fully time. agree with him, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, no, we're, we're used to two hour classes. So asking us to say anything in 20 minutes is very difficult. <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, despite the time constraints, we did allow some extension because I know the topics are so very interesting. And such competent panelists who are there who done full justice to the topic. I'm sure we'll carry on with this uh, conversation. We'll also be planning many more events in the future. Uh, all of you, please join me virtually in giving a big hand to all the three panelists. And uh, Thank you. Uh, we look forward to, to their continued presence here so that they can take on some more questions in the chat box and also set up uh, contacts with others. I uh, already have had many requests here uh, asking us to indicate the coordinates <coughs> panelists. And I'm sure they'll be getting in touch with them privately. Thank you. Uh, Jai Hind.